Welcome to week two, module 2.1. In week two, we're going to be talking about diets, how diets are impacting nutrition and health, and how diets are changing. So let's get started. So what are people eating around the world? What do our diets look like? Well, this figure is showing dietary patterns around the world. On the top, we have fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. These are considered the healthy components of a diet. Below, we have red meat, processed meats. These are the salted and cured meats like hot dogs and salami, sugar-sweetened beverages like soda, trans fats, and sodium. The bars represent gray as global, the different regions of the world and subregions by color. The green is showing you the optimal level of intake. And what you see from this pattern is that not enough consumption across the different regions of the world or globally of fruits, vegetables, and the other healthy components, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. In some regions of the world, they're consuming enough legumes, particularly in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. What you see at the bottom is that people are consuming beyond the optimal intake of red meat, processed meats, sugar-sweetened beverages. Here, the line is right hugging along that y-axis. Trans fats, the partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, and everyone is consuming too much sodium. This is data, estimated model data of actual dietary consumption based on the Global Burden of Disease Project out of the University of Washington. And while it is estimated and modeled, many of the, much of the data, you can glean patterns from this. And the pattern basically shows is that we're not eating enough of the healthy stuff and we're eating too much of the unhealthy stuff of our diets. This is showing you fruit intake uh, comparing the WHO uh, 200 grams per person per day recommendation, recommendation and looking to see if countries are meeting the dietary guideline. And blue is showing you countries where um, they're consuming too few of fruits. And the green is showing you countries that are meeting that dietary guideline. And this is not a global burden of disease data. This is uh, the supply of fruits. So what is produced, what's moved around, and what's imported into the country. So it's a, it's a snapshot of the food supply. So what kind of fruits are available in that country and comparing it to, to the dietary guideline. And much of the world is below the fruit uh, intake. Here's vegetable intake, 250 grams per person per day. Blue, again, not enough of vegetables. Green is showing you meeting the dietary guidelines. And again, this is supply data, so not as good as dietary intake data, but it does give you a snapshot, a picture of, of whether or not the supply is able to meet the demand for, for fruits and vegetables. This is showing you fruit consumption. Uh, fruit supply per person um, compared to GDP per capita, the gross domestic product. And, and it's showing you uh, different countries and the colors are showing you the regions. There's not a real strong correlation between fruit consumption and wealth, um, but you do see some countries that are considered uh, low income, like Rwanda, Sao Tome, where uh, fruit consumption or fruit supply is quite high, um, but they are considered low-income countries. Um, and other places where you have high-income countries and, and, and fruit supply is quite low. But this is a very different story when you look at animal protein. This is showing you a very tight correlation between wealth of countries, GDP uh, uh, per capita, and animal proteins going up with GDP per capita. And these animal proteins are things like meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy. And you can see there's a really strong correlation with wealth and the ability to afford 
animal protein. And you see the exact opposite with a share of energy from cereals, roots, and tubers, things like maize, rice, wheat, potatoes, cassava. You see in many poor countries, high percentage of the calories taken in are coming from these staple grains and tubers. And as countries get wealthier, they tend to decrease uh, the uh, energy coming from these staple grains. And this is very typical of the agriculture economic laws, the Engel law and the Bennett law. As people or countries get wealthier, they tend to diversify their diet and they tend to spend more of their income on other things beyond just food. So this is a very kind of typical pattern that you would see. And when you look at the types of cereals uh, that are being consumed around the world, again, this is food supply data, rice, wheat, and maize are the major commodities consumed around the world. Um, maize being a, uh, a more nutritious crop as compared to rice. You know, maize has 10 to 12% protein versus rice, which is about 4%. Uh, sorghum, a uh, crop indigenous to Africa, has even higher protein content um, than maize, wheat, uh, wheat, and rice. Let's look at children's diets. Well, children in the first two years of life, uh, it's critical for them to meet their nutritional needs for growth and development and cognitive a building. Um, and what we see is when we look at uh, the percentage of children who are exclusively breastfed, and that is the global recommendation, up to the age of six months, children should be exclusively breastfed because of the nutritional factors of breast milk, the immunogenic factors of breast milk are so critically important for many different biological and health outcomes. And, and promote um, overall health and growth of children. And you can see this is showing you regionally comparing 2005 to 2018, and children are not uh, exclusively breastfed across the board, but globally only 42% of children are exclusively breastfed, which is a real missed opportunity to get the right start to life. After that six months, children are introduced to complementary foods, uh, children are introduced to other foods, and what you see is that many children are introduced to grains. 78% of children are, are eating grains, and when you start to look at some of the other nutritionally rich foods, you want high nutritional density in a small package because these children's stomachs are quite small. They can't take in a lot, like animal source foods that are rich in iron and zinc, eggs, legumes, vitamin A rich foods you see very low percentage of children get access to these foods between the ages of 6 to, to 23 months of age. 59% of children only get animal source foods. 44% of children are not fed any fruits and vegetables. This graph on the right is showing you these different food groups again, um, but by wealth quintile with the, the light blue being low-income countries and the very dark blue being upper-middle-income countries. And you can see that poor, children coming from poor households, poor countries, are getting less access to foods like eggs, 13% compared to 44% um, fruits, 18% um, versus 61%, veg, veggies, 48% versus 52%. So children who are coming from poor households, poor families, poor countries tend to get an even less diverse, less quality diet. And let's take a look at adolescence. Again, a second growth spurt. To, uh, adolescent, uh, adolescents are going through puberty. They need extra uh, calories. They need extra nutrients like calcium and iron, vitamin D, to help with that second phase growth spurt in the cycle of life. And when we look from high to low income countries, you can see children and adolescents who are consuming daily fruit, daily vegetables, sugar-sweetened beverages, and those that consume fast food on a daily basis. Um, you can see that across the board, 
no matter income, uh, adolescents are only 34% get um, less than a daily fruit intake, um, 23 to 30% uh, uh, less than the daily vegetable, um, and sugar-sweetened beverages, you really see high consumption in high-income countries um, and 44, 62% and 44% in low-income countries and quite similar findings in fast food intake. So adolescent diets are suboptimal as well. In the next module, we're going to talk about the implications of these diets and particularly the unhealthy portions on nutrition and health. So in this second module of week two, we're going to talk about how diets contribute to the malnutrition and health burden and what that malnutrition and health burden looks like. So let's get started. So diets are critically important throughout the life cycle. In the last module, we saw how diets are, are being consumed, what kind of foods make up those diets around the world. Well, diets, uh, obviously are made up of foods. Those foods have nutrients. They have phytochemicals that have health promoting properties. They also have some anti-nutrients. And throughout the history of, of nutritional research, we've looked at the importance of, of nutrients and foods across the life cycle from pregnancy to lactation, to young children, to adolescents, to adulthood, and, and with the elderly. And we've mapped out the important nutri nutrients that are needed throughout that life cycle. And here's just a chart showing you the change of nutrient needs, obviously, with, with in pregnancy and lactation and early childhood, as well as adolescence, a real need for more nutrients and particular nutrients like iron and zinc and calcium to help for development and growth. And in the last uh, module, we showed that diets are changing. They're more towards uh, unhealthy diet patterns. And when we look at the burden of disease in the world and the top risk factors of that disease and death, we see that dietary risks are the top risk factor for death globally, followed by high blood pressure, tobacco, air pollution. And this is ironic because diets are meant to nourish us, not kill us. So this is a huge problem. And when we look deeper at the risk factors within dietary risk as a, a factor for death and disease and disability, we see that uh, diets that are high in sodium, low in whole grains, low in fruits, veg, nuts, and seeds, omega-3 fatty acids, present the biggest risk factors towards death, as well as DALI's disability adjusted life years. So it's these foods that are health promoting that we are not consuming that contribute to the greatest death and disease, whereas the unhealthy foods have a lower risk factor towards death and disease. And we see that diets are attributable to, to 11 million deaths uh, every year. And most of the death and disability that you see is due to non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and neoplasms, also known as cancer. So more people are dying of non-communicable diseases than communicable diseases, and we'll come back to that a bit later. The other uh, consequence of poor diets is malnutrition. Malnutrition in all of its forms is massive and complex. And let me break down a couple of statistics. Well, first, we have 821 million people who go to bed hungry every night. That number over the last three years has been rising. And that's this graph on, on the left showing you by numbers and percentage prevalence of those that go to bed hungry, we see that number increasing over the last three years. And the FAO, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, attributes that mainly to conflict and climate change. 
And we can imagine under the context of COVID, we're going to see this number rise even further. We have 144 million children who are stunted. So that's children under the age of five are a short height for their age. And that has other repercussions associated with it, including uh, long-term uh, uh, inadequate development, poor cognitive development, um, and a host of other health implications. 47 million children are wasted. That number is largely not changed in the last decade. These are children who are acutely malnourished. You can think of issues of seasonal hunger, famines, acute illness like diarrhea, enteropathy that can cause children to have rapid weight loss. So this is a low weight uh, for height. We have 38 million children under the age of five who are overweight, and that number has been staying steady for the last few years. And shockingly, we have 2.68 billion adults who are overweight and obese. This number just came out today in the Global Nutrition Report, which was an increase from the last Global Nutrition Report in 2018, which reported 2.1 billion adults are overweight and obese. And when we break this 2.68 billion down, more women than men are overweight. So when we look at stunting, there's a lot of disparities within regions. This is showing you Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, and here we have global. And what you see is that stunting's come down almost everywhere, but some places, much uh, uh, smaller reductions in the stunting declines as compared to places like in Asia, a lot of this having to do with China, for example, here, um, as well as India, we've seen declines in, in stunting, whereas Africa has seen uh, much lower declines in stunting. But it has come down. And again, showing you variation, this is very uh, micro geospatial data, five by five kilometer data, showing you the hot spots of where stunting is persisting. So this is stunting prevalence in 2000 on the continent of Africa, 2005, 2010, and in 2015, you see these hot spots in some places in the world, many of these places being dryland areas, um, where stunting uh, prevalence, uh, high prevalence is persisting. Uh, Asia is home to most of the children who are wasted. This is the acute malnourished situation. Um, and you can see uh, Asia has 32% of children are moderate or, and severely wasted and 10% who are severely wasted. And you can see there's a huge difference between Asia and Africa of wasted children. So most of the children um, who are uh, acutely malnourished are, are residing in Asia, much of that due to sanitation and hygiene and other factors. And when we look at progress on overweight in children under five, you see this increase. So stunting's been coming down, albeit slowly, but obesity, overweight in, under, in children under the age of five is increasing almost everywhere with the exception of, of Central Asia where it's coming down. But overall, we're seeing an uptick in overweight and obesity over the last uh, 10 years in children under five. And when we look at uh, other disaggregated data like urban and rural, rich to poor countries, moms that have uh, secondary education versus moms that have primary education and sex disaggregation, girls and boys, you see stunting um, is much higher in, in rural places. Um, it's higher amongst poor countries, and obviously it's higher in, uh, with, uh, with mothers with less education. Wasting, we see quite similar levels between urban and rural, similar levels between girls and boys, a bit more wasting in, in poor countries, and, uh, and pretty much the same with education levels of, among mothers. Overweight. Rural's catching up with the urban places, boys and girls, boys a bit more wealthier, having more uh, overweight, and, and as well as the higher education, which is typically what you would see, but that's rapidly changing. 
When we look at children over the age of five, so school-age children up through adolescence, we see some interesting trends. Males are in blue, females are in orange, and this is showing you from 2000 to 2016. We've seen declines in underweight by gender in both um, male and female, but still these numbers are quite high. We still have a lot of school-age children and adolescents who are underweight, and we see exactly the opposite happening with overweight and obesity. We see this rising in children and adolescents, much like we're seeing in children under the age of five. And adult malnutrition, again, same pattern. We see uh, coming down, underweight coming down uh, over the last 15 years and overweight and obesity rising with women having higher uh, prevalence of obesity than, than men. And here's a map just showing you adult overweight and obesity um, with the lighter colors being less than 10% the very dark reds uh, moving up 30, 40%. Obviously, the United States, places like Australia, some parts of South America, North Africa, Middle East, topping out at very high levels of overweight and obesity. And really those uh, sitting in Central Africa, West Africa, some parts of South and East Asia, still keeping their overweight and obesity low, but that's changing quite rapidly. When we look at uh, malnutrition by wealth. This is showing you children and adolescents, um, underweight uh, males, uh, low to high income, the low being the dark blue, high income being the, the dotted uh, uh, circles. And it's showing you child, adolescents, and adult um, underweight to overweight and obesity. And you can see a real uh, difference between low and high income um, for underweight with high income having much less underweight uh, men and, and boys. Um, whereas overweight, it's the opposite. We're seeing um, more uh, high and upper income, middle income. Um, and you see this in adults as well. You see very similar patterns. In that high income, you see uh, is very high in overweight and obesity, um, similar patterns in, in women as well and girls. So, but this is changing and I'll come back to that. And one of the big consequences of obesity is these non-communicable diseases, which I mentioned earlier. So looking at uh, the disability adjusted life years, uh, per 100,000 individuals, you can see the burden of disease. You see very high in many parts of the world with some places in sub-Saharan Africa um, and, and some places in, in, in Asia being incredibly high in, in non-communicable disease burden. And this is the opposite showing you communicable disease, neonatal, maternal, nutritional deficiencies, looking at DALIs. And again, you see similarly a lot of burden of communicable diseases. So these countries of sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and to East Asia, you see very high burdens of both non-communicable and communicable diseases. But this is shifting. We used to see much more communicable diseases um, in the world, and that's slowly being reduced and being replaced with more non-communicable disease in the last 30 years. We see many countries with multiple burdens of malnutrition. This is showing you countries uh, with overlapping burdens of child stunting, anemia, and overweight in women. So in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, shown in orange, you have this triple burden of malnutrition. In some places in gray, showing high burdens of anemia and stunting. Uh, and the lighter gray showing um, burdens of overweight and anemia or overweight and stunting. So many countries are experiencing double and triple burdens with Africa, again, and South Asia, East Asia, having these significant double and triple burdens. We also see 
double burdens in children. So a child can be stunted and overweight. A child can be stunted and wasted. You can have a child who's stunted, wasted, and have micronutrient deficiencies. So on the body of a child, they can be suffering from multiple burdens. And we see children, uh, 16 million children are stunted and wasted. 8 million children are stunted and overweight. Much of that in Asia and Africa. And this is incredibly detrimental to households and communities. So you can have an individual having double burdens. You can have a household having double burdens and a country having double burdens or triple burdens. One of the areas of malnutrition that we don't totally understand is who is suffering from micronutrient deficiencies. You often see this quote of 2 billion people suffer from some type of micronutrient deficiency, vitamin A, iron, zinc, vitamin D, all the vitamins and minerals. But we really don't know the state of micronutrient deficiencies. These are just estimates and we need better evidence. And it's hard to capture this data because you need to take blood samples, it's very expensive, it's very difficult to do in low resource areas, and it's very costly. So now we're dealing with this very complex situation. This is a picture by Andrew Prentice, who works in the Gambia, showing visually this double burden. Many women are dealing with overweight and obesity. Their children tend to be underweight. So how do we deal with this? So we're seeing this burden, this double burden grow among individuals, households, and communities, and it's disproportionately affecting the poorest and the most vulnerable. A recent study came out showing that in many low income and middle income countries, they're suffering the most from these double burdens. And that's often because many of these countries are in transition, the way people grow, the way they live, the way they work, the way they consume food, the way they're moving is shifting. And we're going to talk about that in the next, in the next uh, lecture. And this is showing you countries with double burdens. Children who are stunted and wasted and adults who have either a 20% overweight prevalence, 30% overweight prevalence, and 40% overweight prevalence with from light to dark colors. This is showing you countries dealing with these double burdens in the 90s and then in 2010. And you see a real shift to low income, middle income settings. So look at India light up in 2010. Look at Africa light up, get darker. Mexico, less double burden. South America, less double burden. And this is showing this by wealth quintile with Q1 being lowest income, Q4 being highest income, you see that countries have really changed their status um, from the 1990s to 2010s and that it used to be countries having a high burden. And now you see low income uh, countries having the double burden um, of, of malnutrition over the last 20 years. So there's been a real shift from, from high to low. And what are the consequences? Well, they're quite devastating and they're intergenerational. We know that with overweight and obesity and undernutrition, individuals have a higher risk of morbidity, mortality, disability, and a low quality of life. With undernutrition, particularly stunting as a proxy for undernutrition, we have seen high risks of lifelong cognitive impairments. We also see undernutrition increases the risk of being obese in a, to adulthood and suffering from non-communicable diseases. So you're born undernourished, you die overnourished. So it's a terrible double fate. We know there's social uh, consequences with undernutrition. We've seen a uh, Long-term prospective trials show 22 to 45% reductions in lifetime earnings. We've seen with loss of adult height, less productivity. And we've seen with overweight and obesity and undernutrition, 
higher lifetime health costs, more time spent in the health system that can be quite costly. And economically, this can be devastating for countries. Losses of 16% um, uh, GDP growth in some countries, ranging from 3 to 16%. So it can be quite devastating from a health perspective, a long-term development perspective, social earning capacity, livelihoods perspective, as well as economic and uh, economic growth and development of nations. In this last module of week two, we're gonna talk about how diets are changing. So let's get started. When we look at uh, consumption patterns, this is showing you a graph of change from 1990 to 2015. And it's looking at global levels in dark blue, Low and lower middle income countries in tan color, upper middle and light blue, and high income countries in orange of different foods over time in the percentage change. And what you see is there's been an uptick in, in most regions, with the exception of upper middle in cheese, uh, an increase in sugar sweetened beverages, that's SSB, in, in low and low middle income countries. There's been an increase in nuts and seeds in high-income countries and processed meats. And there's been a real decrease across these other food groups, a decline in, in the consumption of these foods. And this is data from the Global Dietary Database, which is, is intake data, both actual intake, modeled, and estimated data. And what you can see here is uh, changes in Added sugar is in dark blue, uh, total protein is in orange, and total energy is in light blue globally. So you see this increase in sugar and total protein and a decline in total energy, where you see a real mixed picture when you look across income classifications with low and middle income countries seeing a slight rise in, in sugar and protein coming up, energy coming down. And um, really the same in upper and middle income countries um, uh, with the percentage of total uh, calories per day being a bit higher. And then income countries, um, you see a real flattening of, of protein and sugar and a decline in, in energy. And when we look at trends in food demand by income group, you can see that um, over time, since 1960 and high, as compared to low and middle income countries, we've seen um, this increase in cereals. Uh, we've seen increases in animal products and vegetable oils um, in, in, in high income countries. But you really see this uptick in, in animal products in, in, in low and middle income countries. There's also a growing demand for meat. We see in places like China, 13 to 15 times higher calories of meat consumed per capita per day um, from 1960 to 2010. Uh, places in Brazil, um, places in Saudi Arabia, Angola, Spain, um, um, some part, other parts of Western Europe, uh, Southeast Asia seen five to six times increased demand in kilocalories of meat, um, whereas other places um, seen quite steady or almost declines in, in meat consumption. So it really depends on where you are, but there is largely a growing demand for meat over the last 40 years. There's also changes in the types of food traded. What this is showing is, is per capita fruit imports by region over time, where you see an increase in, in fruit uh, imports from, from global trade and in, in international trade um, in Europe and North America and the Middle East. And it's a bit flatter in the sub-Saharan Africa as well as in Asia. You see sugar rising in many places, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, North America, 
uh, in Europe, you see this rise in sugar trade um, and availability of, 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 of sweets. And this is just showing you over time the types of imports across different commodities uh, where you can see milk increasing, you see cereals increasing, um, the dark red is fruits, excluding wine, um, and as well as um, in purple showing you some of the um, uh, sugars and, and vegetable oils increasing. So the volume of trade from 93 to 2013 has significantly risen, as well as the growth of, of many of the commodities being traded. So international trade is working effectively, and we can talk more about that in the discussion. And it has obviously some positives and negative consequences of that effectiveness. When we look at processed packaged foods, those are things like cereals, uh, sweet snacks, crackers, ice cream, um, you know, canned soups, baked goods, all of the highly processed foods, some more uh, negatively associated with health outcomes than others. Um, you can see by region in North America, we're actually declining in our per capita sales of these processed packaged foods as compared to um, um, Europe is, is, is been slightly declining, but you see this real rise in Oceania, Latin America, Africa, and just globally, you see this increase in sales of processed packaged foods. They're cheap, they're convenient, they can be stored on shelves for a long time. But what to, to, you should notice here is that just the volume of sales in North America is so much higher as compared to Asia, Latin America, and Africa overall. So while our, we have been declining in sales of those kinds of foods, we still have a high a level of sales and, and, and followed by that consumption of processed packaged foods in North America. This is showing you the same kind of foods, uh, but by uh, income classification. So country income classification. So high income countries, upper middle, lower middle and low. And again, you see this slight rise in high income countries in sales of processed packaged foods you see a real sharp increase over time with projections in 2022 here in upper middle, uh, low middle uh, countries, you see this, this rise in processed packaged foods. Sales of sugar sweetened beverages also can be looked at by high to low income countries. And you see this flattening in high income countries over time with projections staying steady out to 2022. Whereas in upper middle income countries and lower middle income countries, you're seeing this rise in, in the sales of these sugar sweetened beverages that sodas, juices, ready to drink, coffees, as, uh, teas, etc. that are sugary. Well, why do we care about these processed foods? Well, what's called ultra processed foods or food-like substances that are high in added sugars, they're high in unhealthy fats like trans fats and saturated fats, and high in sodium, there's more and more evidence accumulating that they're not healthy, they're not good for human health. There was a very important study by Hall et al. where they looked at 20 inpatient adults. They exposed them to an ultra-processed diet versus a very unprocessed diet for 14 days. And that ultra-processed diet caused increased energy intake, weight gain, um, despite the, the control group being presented with the same amount of calories, sugar, fat, uh, sodium, fiber, and macronutrients. It's that something about those ultra-processed foods that caused a lot of weight gain in, in, in that uh, very controlled population. Now, you could argue 20 patients doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine doing these kind of studies to really isolate and control all the environmental factors that can influence weight gain or health outcomes. You can't put people in a room and lock them away and force feed them a diet for 10 years, and you can't do that with a lot of people. So this is a very... Uh, uh, special conundrum of nutrition studies 
in that it's very hard to do these kind of trials in a controlled setting, unlike a drug trial. But this was an important study that came out just last year and is building the evidence base that ultra processed foods are not uh, ideal for health uh, and uh, nutritional status. And when we look at the transformation of ultra processed food and beverages, um, so this is a special category of these processed foods, you see there's been a real change in in an in increase in in sales of these foods across the different regions comparing 2002 to 2016. We've seen a real uptick in these ultra processed food products across regions, with the exception of North America, as well as ultra processed drinks, sodas, sugar sweetened beverages, etc. You've seen a real increase in those kinds of foods. So this is a bit worrisome when we're thinking about the disease burden. And last, from on the diet side, we're really changing the way we purchase and eat food. These are three graphs showing you in the U.S. the proportion of U.S. grocery spending made online. You see this rise, and I think you've all experienced this in these projections in which people will buy more and more of their food online. We also see, and this is showing you Latin America, more people are eating away from home. They're going out to restaurants. They're going out and eating street food. They're going to fast casual restaurants. And they're consuming a lot of food away from home. And this is showing you Latin America in black and some specific countries within Latin America. So people are not walking into their kitchens as much to cook. They're having other people cook for them. And I would even argue people are not walking into grocery stores. More and more people are having people shop for them. They're having people cook for them. And this is really interesting phenomenon in China, in which many young people under the age of 30 are not only ordering their food, their groceries online, but they're ordering pre-cooked food to be delivered to their home. So cooked meals coming to their house. So they're not walking into a store, but they're not walking into their kitchen either. And we're seeing this uh, really uh, change. Maybe with COVID, more people are going back and, and cooking in their kitchens. Obviously, walking into grocery stores is much more challenging under the COVID pandemic situation. But maybe people are gaining culinary skills and learning to cook again. What we do notice is that people watch cooking more than they actually do cooking. And that's an interesting trend when we think about passing on culinary traditions and, and how diets are changing.